Prepare to embark on an extraordinary journey, a journey into the heart of Rumi's most powerful and exquisite poem, recited with unparalleled grace and force. What is to be done, O Muslims? For I know myself not. Neither a Christian am I, nor a Jew, nor a Magian, nor Muslim. This is not just any Rumi poem. It is regarded as the very best, a gem within the treasure chest of Persian poetry. And today, you're about to experience it in a way that's nothing short of extraordinary. Guiding us through this rare and special presentation is none other than Professor Sayyid Hossein Nasser, a scholar of profound wisdom and a masterful orator. Together, we'll immerse ourselves in the mystic verses of Rumi, hearing the melodic cadence in both Persian and English, a fusion of two worlds that will leave you spellbound. And we begin with a very famous poem of his that in a sense is related very much to the theme about which I'm going to speak. As the poem that many people know, it says, Murda bodam, zende shodam, gerye bodam, khande shodam. Dolat ishq aamad man, dolat paayande shodam. All the translations, I'll make a room here, my own translations uh, tonight, uh, which nobody can translate these poems, but to the extent that is possible, uh, which I will translate as, I was dead, I became quickened, quickened in the old, old English sense, I brought back to life, quickened. I was tears, I became laughter. The dominion of love came, and I became the enduring dominion. Of course, the word dolat can be translated in many ways, but I think here goes the word dominion. That is when uh, love comes, uh, one enters into the eternal presence, which never disappears. Uh, from the point of view of this remarkable sage, and from the point of view of wisdom itself, uh, most human beings think they are alive, but they're really dead, because our heart is dead. And to live in this world, is to try to bring our heart back to life. We need to learn to live. And that living is only possible if our heart once again reverberates in the rhythm of the eternal life for which it was created. And so uh, the goal of a great master like Rumi, he was not a poet, he was not a cultural icon of Iran, these are secondary or of Turkey. He was one of the greatest sages who ever lived, uh, a mystic, a philosopher, a spiritual being of the highest order. The goal of all of his writings, of all his activities, not only his music, uh, his poetry, but also his music, was precisely to bring us back to life, to renew our life, to make us be alive instead of being dead, as he said in this poem, more the Bodams and the Shodam. I was dead and I became alive. Musalmanan, Keman Khodra Nimidanam, Nat Hafsa, Na Yahudaman, Na Gabram, Na Musalmanan, Na Sharriam, Na Karbiam, Na Barriam, Na Bahriam, Na as Kone Tadiyam, Na as Aflo Kegardanam. نه از خاکم، نه از آبم، نه از بادم، نه از آتش، نه از عرشم، نه از فرشم، نه از کونم، نه از کانم نه از هندم، نه از چینم، نه از برقار شخصینم، نه از ملک اراقینم، نه از ملک خاک خراسانم نه از دنیا، نه از اقبا، نه از جنت، نه از دوزخ، نه از آدم، نه از حوا، نه از فردوس و رزوانم مکانم لا مکان باشد نشانم بی نشان باشد نه تن باشد نه جان باشد که من از جان جانانم دویی از خود به در کردم یکی دیدم دو عالم را یکی جویم یکی دانم یکی بینم یکی خانم هو الاول هو الاخر هو الظاهر هو الباطن به جو یا هو یا من هو 
کسی دیگر نمیدانم چه جام عشق سرمستم دو عالم رفته از دستم به جز رندی یا قلاشی نباشد هیچ سامانم اگر در عمر خود روزی دمی بر تو برآوردم از آن وقت و از آن ساعت چه عمر خود پشیمانم اگر دستم دهد روزی دمی با تو در این خلوت دو عالم زیر پای آرم همی دستی برفشانم الا ای شمس تبریزی چون این مستم در این عالم که جز بستی و قلاشی نباشد هیچ دستانم What is to be done, O Muslims? For I know myself not. Neither a Christian am I, nor a Jew, nor Magian, nor Muslim. Neither of the East am I, nor West, nor of the land, nor sea, nor of nature's quarry, nor of heaven circling above. I am not made of earth or water. not of wind or fire, nor am I of the divine throne, nor of the floor carpeting, nor of the domain of the cosmos, nor of minerals. I am not from India, nor China, nor Bulgaria, nor Turkestan. I am not from the kingdom of the two Iraqs, nor from the earth of Khorasan. Neither of this world I am nor the next, nor of heaven nor hell, nor from Adam nor Eve, nor of Eden, nor paradise, nor the supreme garden. My place is the placeless. My mark is the markless. Not either body or soul, for I myself, the beloved am. I am cast, I cast aside duality. seeking the two worlds as one. I see the one, I know the one, I see the one, seek the one, I call the one. He is the first, he is the last, he is the outward, he is the inward. I know no one other than he, none but he who is he, drunk with the goblet of love I am. The two worlds have to be been lost. No rest I have but in debauchery, no rest but in drunkenness. If I spent a moment of my life without thee, I regret that moment. I for that hour of my life do repent. If one day I'm given a moment with thee in this spiritual retreat, I shall trample the two worlds underfoot and dance in ecstasy. O oh, Shams of Tabriz, I'm so drunk in this world, But for the drunkenness and the revelry, no story how I to account. Now this is Rumi. This is Rumi. Yeah, you cannot express more universal identity than he does in this incredible ghazal. And this should not be, therefore, in any, identified in any way with parochialism. One of the ways that Rumi can bring us to life, renewal of life in our day and age, is to posit uh, globalism that at the same time does not desecrate the particularity of cultures. All cultures are particular. All languages are particular. In the same way, they cannot have a universal language unless you force one language, like Chinese or English, upon the rest of humanity. But each country has its own language. In the same way, it is with uh, the truth, the truth itself. The truth is both universal and it is always, culturally speaking, particular. Now, how to combine like the love of humanity with the love of your father and mother? They're particular beings, they're not the whole of humanity. How to combine the two? It's a very, very difficult task, very difficult task. And one of the ways that Rumi is able to address one of the primary problems of humanity today is to be able to love the whole without loving the part to which we belong any less. Let me put it this way. And the whole would include everything, uh, all different categories and the part to which we belong, every different category. Now, another aspect of Rumi 
that is extremely significant uh, that makes him the renewer of life for, for us is that uh, what he teaches concerns everything. We have two types of great uh, Sufi masters in Islamic history. Those who were wrote primarily on very profound metaphysical and philosophical questions like Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi is the great, very great master for the elite. The other were people who were, who were just as profound in their understanding of the truth, but whose vocation was to be able to expand it for everyone. And this was usually done through the language of poetry. One of the greatest achievements of Islamic civilization, not only in Persian, but also Arabic, Turkish, or the other major languages of Islamic civilization, was to be able to create a language which was shared spiritually by the saint and by the beggar in the street and everyone in between, by the most educated and by the illiterate. Any of you who's lived in the Islamic world, either in Iran itself or Pakistan, or India, uh, our world, know that oftentimes you find a simple person who's begging in the street who knows more Sufi poetry than all the professors in Washington put together. Uh, that, that is a very, very common thing. And there was the, the percolation, the percolation of the profoundest ideas into simplest forms and into all layers of society was one of the remarkable achievements of Islamic uh, civilization, of Sufism, and particularly of Rumi. Particularly Rumi. I've traveled very extensively in the Islamic world, except for the Arab world, where Rumi is not well known. Rumi was translated twice, the Mastavi, into Arabic. One was shortly after his death, one 700 years later, when uh, Ziba Kalam translated in Iran about 50 years ago. But he's not well known in the Arab world. But in the Turkish world, including all the way to Albania, and of course in Iran and Afghanistan, where the mother tongue is the same as that of Rumi, and all of Central Asia, and all of Muslim India, all of Muslim India, there is no one who has not read something of Rumi, who does not know something of Rumi. I've met uh, beggars, I've told some of my students stories of, uh, uh, in the streets of Delhi, who found out it was a Persian, who they would quote Persian poems, despite all the attempt of the British to destroy the Persian language in India. They didn't succeed completely. They did almost, but not completely. So this is universality of the spread of the teachings of Maulana throughout most of the Islamic world. And now, interestingly enough, it's spreading into the Malay world for the first time. The Mastab has been translated into Malay. Uh, Bahasa Malay is just coming out, second volume, book two just came out, I wrote a long introduction for the first volume, the first volume is out, and uh, all the six volumes will be out very soon, inshallah, it's a major achievement, an unbelievable thirst that exists in the Malay world, maybe a century from now, the Malay world will be included along with the other worlds, as a place where the teachings of Rumi spread, and uh, one of the reasons that this vast spread is that he speaks to all levels of human society. I said, uh, I've had experience in my life when uh, I was a child, my father used to take me that these literary sessions once a week uh, with six or seven of the greatest of scholars of Iran at that time, many of whom were very, uh, you know, prime ministers, head of the parliament, people like that, or for will be people like that. And he would sit down and he would take me along, my father, three, four hours just discussing one verse of Hafez or Rumi, just one or two verses. And uh, at the same time, the fellow in the street who was selling beets or bread also knew some verses of Rumi. We, have, we do not have something like that in the English language. The great metaphysical poets like John Donne, people like that, are not known by the ordinary people. Uh, certainly not in our day and age, when poetry has been forgotten. Perhaps the time of Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the closest to it. Shakespeare is the person who speaks, at least when he wrote his place. Now, if you speak Shakespeare in English, they think you're putting on an act as a Harvard Don or something like that, a professor. But in the old days, in the Elizabethan period, that was the closest thing you can find in the English language, and nothing in French, absolutely nothing. France has produced great uh, prose writers, but very few great poets. The greatest poet is Victor Hugo, uh, or Baudelaire, or someone like that. They're at fifth-rate Persian poets. I mean, they, don't have to answer. they cannot compare the Hobbes and... Molana, but even coming down the line. So, but English, you have this uh, uh, image of Shakespeare in your mind that Shakespeare was quoted 
by the literary figures at Oxford and Cambridge and so forth, but this place came out at the same time was known to the population and high school students had to memorize some verses. Now, much less so, and translate this place of Shakespeare into poetry. That's what Rumi is in the uh, Islamic world. That is, he speaks to all levels, and uh, his language is deceivingly simple. Uh, deceivingly simple, because it usually stories, stories of a parrot or of a slave girl or of a, a king doing this, of a fort, uh, Deja uh, all of these things like that. Uh, it seems that simple, but the most profound realities are expressed in it, and it like a net. It's like that's, uh, that is cast into the whole of life. And that, this is uh, the aspect of the Mastery that makes it like the Quran, uh, at, uh, the famous uh, poem of Abdurrahman Jami uh, said that the spiritual Mastery of Jalaluddin Rumi is the Quran in the Persian language. Has Quran dar zabon uh, a remarkable uh, statement to make. Uh, because the Quran, in a sense, is like a net that catches the human being, wherever he is, whoever he is, and drags him towards God without knowing it even. And uh, Mastery is like that also. It speaks about all kinds of things, all kinds of people. But everything is imbued with the sacred, with the sense of the sacred. And so it's a net of the sacred cast into the world. And that's what makes has made him such a universal figure throughout Islamic history. And this is one of the reasons that unconsciously so many people are attracted to Rumi today. We live in a world that is desacralized. The sacred is forgotten. And the role of modernism is to vacuum clean whatever remains of the sacred. Uh, Mershe Eliade in his book, The Sacred and the Profane, was quite right. He said, modernism will not stop until it's destroyed all that is sacred. Uh, that's what modernism does. But it's not going to succeed because the sacred is the nature of reality. And this, the yearning for the sacred remains in us, even if we have rejected the sacred. It is that yearning that attracts so many people to the Masnavi and the other poetry of Rumi. It's something that's missing in us that finds fulfillment in it without being able to define in our mind what we mean by the sacred. Another very important uh, aspect of Rumi's teachings, which are important for the renewal of life, is the language of Rumi. Uh, Rumi wrote a few prose works. Uh, the m most important, the book called Fihi Mafi. The title is in Arabic, and it means in it is what is in it. Fihi Mafi. And it's been translated into English by Arbery as the Discourses as a second translation. Uh, it's a table talks of Rumi. And then there are the seven majalis, seven majalis, which is in Arabic and a few letters which Rumi wrote in Persian. The rest of his pr production is all poetry. Now, this is one of the very remarkable phenomena. Rumi began his life as a religious scholar. He didn't write any poetry. He wrote prose. He taught at the madrasa. He was both a theologian. He was also a member of the Sabbath already. He received the Sufi from his father, Adin Balat. Not uh, later on. The other, uh, other masters came later, but he received from his father. But he did not write any poetry until this great transformation take, came over him and uh, is symbolized by the presence of Shams Tabrizi, an enigmatic figure who is both a human being and a function, a spiritual function in his life. I'm not going to talk about Shams at all. My former student, a brilliant uh, scholar, William Chitty, has written a book called Shams and Me, and it is a very, very good book. If you want to read something about Shams, you should read that book, an extensive book that came out last year. I'm not going to talk about Shams, but it's Shams symbolizes also. It's not only human being, symbolizes spiritual function into which I will not go. But once that came into his life, as I've said elsewhere in one of my writings in the room, it was like a meteor coming close to earth. It causes tidal waves, waves in the ocean. This meteor came close to Rumi and it caused these tidal waves which came out in the form of poetry. So he never considered himself to be a, a poet. And he always, uh, he, in a very famous poem of Rumi, he says, <laughs> That 
that if Faradin Atar, the great Sufi poet, the Horan, had traversed the seven cities of love, we are still stuck at the bent of the first street. And all humility, he, uh, so he, did, he didn't even consider himself to be a poet, he was a poet in spite of himself, in spite of himself. But uh, his soul was rhythmic, I mean, uh, an unbelievable sensitivity to both poetry and music. Uh, it is said that in the old days, I would tell this story, uh, Persians used to wear oftentimes shoes, so did the Turks, that had wood un underneath rather than leather. The heels were made of wood. We would go to bathhouses in Iran even today. And uh, so it made some noise. And uh, the stairs were pretty tall in those days. When the roommate would go from the first stage to the second, uh, third step going up to the second floor, the very sound of the shoe of the, uh, that was, they were making, talk, 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 would put him into a heart, would put him into a, a spiritual state. He would just go into another world for a long, long time. He was that sensitive to beauty, to the beauty of sound and to the beauty of rhythm, because his soul was already in rhythm, the divine rhythm. And so uh, everything that came out of it, that soul was in the form of poetry, uh, in the deepest sense, in the deepest sense. And therefore, uh, he was able to mold the Persian language in such a way that uh, the poetry was able to express everything that needs to be expressed really for the spiritual life. I consider the greatest Persian poet not to be Rumi, but to be Hafez, spiritual poet, um, unbelievable, he's a divine poet really, he's not human almost. Uh, but Hafez does not speak in the same way that Rumi does. Rumi speaks for to almost everyone. There's nothing, no one on the surface of the earth to whom one of the lines of Rumi will not have some meaning someday in life. There is, there's no, I've never met anyone uh, if they were only to find out. And so this language itself is, makes it accessible. If Rumi had produced like, in Arabic, 500 major books in Arabic in prose, he probably would not have been as popular as he is today. It's this ocean of poetry, and now a mind by people who are not even Persian. Most of the famous translators of Rumi in English today don't know Persian. I don't want to name any names, but uh, they, none of them knows Persian well. And they usually get help from some Afghan or Persian, and then they render it into, or take the Nicholson translation of the Masnavi, which is prose, which is not poetry, and then turn it into poetry, English poetry or American poetry, I like to call it. Now, uh, b before uh, the world comes to an end, I have to end my, t my talk, and I want to t t turn now to something very important spiritually, and that is that... Uh, Rumi's poetry and through the poetry a spiritual presence that exists in it uh, are very, very important, of course, for the renewal of life on the individual level, on the social and individual level. I'll talk about the social level in a moment. Uh, from a spiritual point of view, no social society can have its life renewed unless the life of the individual is renewed. Uh, renewal always begins inwardly with us. In the same way that every step we take in every direction has to be from where we are. I cannot take a step from the other side of the room because I'm standing here. Whether I want to go this way or this way, I have to start from where we are. We have no choice but to start from where we are. And therefore, who we are, who we are, and try to f discover who we are. And so the most important message of Rumi for the renewal of life is the renewal of the life of the individual, of course. Now, here, there's so much to say, but I have to be very short. I want to, first of all, uh, remove a very major error that exists in the study of Rumi today, not only in America, but also among a lot of Persians and uh, Turks and others uh, who consider Rumi as a kind of nationalistic emblem. Rumi was a Muslim. He was a Muslim poet. He never missed his prayers. He said, Agla kuntu fadaya Mustafa. Uh, sacrifice your intellect at the feet of, of the Prophet. And uh, the Masabi is a Quranic commentary. It's a commentary on the Quran. He knew the Quran extremely well. And uh, at the beginning of the Masabi, which is in Arabic, not in English, he says this is a remarkable sentence. He said, this book is Had al-Kitab, Usul al Usul al Usul al Usul al Din is the principle of the principle of the principle of the principle of religion. 
Yakin and other things that come afterwards. So it's, it's very, very clear that this work is dealing with the heart of religion. There's no secular Rumi, which is authentic. You cannot have this in one sentence, authenticity, secularity, and Rumi. You can have Rumi secularized. Everything in our world is secularized. Even the Virgin is secularized in some form of Christianity and the art and so forth that goes with it, with her, the, her iconography. That's uh, the, the West, the secularized place. Everything that comes in there is secularized. There's no doubt about it. But uh, it cannot preserve its authenticity. And everything in the West is not completely secularized. There are things which are not secularized. There's the Catholic Church, there are other Christian denomination, their practices, the Judaism, all kinds of religions still survive in the West despite everything. It's in order to understand Rumi, you must understand that he was not a New Age poet. He was not born in California. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he does not represent what we're looking for, a kind of uh, bland, uh, sentimental, let's love each other, uh, universality in which you don't, you don't have to do anything either for yourself for God to correct yourself. You don't have to reform ourselves, we just get together and be happy. He's not that kind of poet at all, and you must understand that. And uh, the relation of Rumi with Islam, once severed, will make Rumi irrelevant uh, as a spiritual therapy, a spiritual therapy. Because there's a secret also to Rumi, and that is that uh, Rumi is one of the very few Sufi masters who's able to guide beyond the grave. It's a very, very uh, esoteric aspect of his teaching. Probably none of you have ever, ever heard about it, don't know what I'm talking about, but there are a few in this class in this room who do. But uh, there's spiritual guidance in Sufism. The spiritual guidance always emanates from God and the Prophet, the power of it, the possibility of it. And usually when a master dies, that is finished. There are few people in the Islamic world whom God has given this power of guiding beyond the grave. And one of them is Rumi, Jaladin Rumi. And many people in Turkey go to his tomb. Uh, another one is, uh, another context, is the eighth Shiite Imam, Ali Arreda, you know, Imam Raza in Khorasan, who is called the Imam of Initiation. And, and people go, go there to, for spiritual guidance of, of a man who died 1100 years ago at the time of Mammon at the beginning of the Abbasid period. But anyway, it's very, very important to realize that uh, the, all of the message of Rumi, everything that he wrote, is just in order for us to remember God, to bring us to God. And he has so many poems about this. And the main goal of it is the inner transformation. He always faces with, with the fact that we're going to die, that this life is a short life, that while we are alive, let us seek the eternal life, which knows no death. I mean, there's so many beautiful poems. Uh, the one which I quote so often, but I should quote it for you again here. The robe mire khaje qabl az mordanat ta nabashat zahmat jandadanat. Anchanan margi ke dar nuri ravi. Nechanan margi ke dar guri ravi. O master, go and die before you die. It's of course Hadith of the Prophet, Mutu Qabla Anta Mutu. The Prophet said, Die before you die. And he puts in Persian poem. Uh, so that when you die, you will not suffer the pain of death. Die such a death that you will go unto light, not the death that will lead you to the grave. Rumi always talks about this. You cannot. Study Rumi without understanding the spiritual significance of death, that is death to the lower self, and the resurrection of what is within us, the renewal of life in the real sense. Now, on the social level also, Rumi, uh, of course, has a great deal to provide for us, but not in America so much, because there's no organization. But if you look at the history of the Islamic world, the role played by the Molavi order in the Ottoman Empire, is really in, un, unbelievable. First of all, two of the Ottoman sultans were members of the Maulavi order. Many of the viziers and the grand viziers and generals and so forth and so on, they belonged to the order. They were so powerful that when Kamal the Turk came to power, in order to break the power of religion in Turkey, the first thing they did was to ban the, the Maulavis. 
before any other order, before the Rafais, the Qadiris, anybody else. He bound the Mawlavi order and many of their shares were put to death in prison, ways which have never been told in public, but uh, great tragedies. It's now opening up again a little bit in Turkey. They're, they're beginning to, to function. But it played a very important social role that Rumi did. It's, it, this is important to understand, uh, very, very important to understand in our day and age. Some people identify efficacy with only its social aspect. A person is important or has a social function. Some people just the other way. But in fact, this depends on one's vocation. There are people whose presence in the world is invisible. All saints, in a sense, play a role in preserving the equilibrium of the world, even if they're not known, if they're not if they're known. Others whose, whose function, whose presence is visible. And Rumi was one of the people who was, ve- who was very visible. He created one of the most important and powerful Sufi orders in the history of Islam, which had disciples from Albania to Tunisia, going on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, 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 thousands upon thousands of people who were followers, and the Tariqa was decimated in 1924, when it was banned by the new Turkish parliament that would follow the caliphate or sultanate, uh, Ottoman world. And uh, it's underground to some extent, but it still survives. And they still have disciples also in Macedonia, in uh, Albania, all kinds of places. Anyway, uh, the important thing to realize is that uh, for Rumi, as a very good model, the effect of human beings in this world is not an either-or matter, that either the, the primacy of the individual or the primacy of society. They go together. Uh, they go together and depends on one's vocation. The important thing is to see what God wants of us, what he wants us to do, but not exclude either side, one side or the other. It's amazing how a man like Rumi, who never created a political party, who never ran for office, you might say the modern sense that didn't try to join a government. Uh, he, he had more power than many kings did. It's Tariqa, the Tariqa Maulavia, the role it played in the 700 years of Ottoman history, 600 years of Ottoman history, is absolutely amazing. So this is also, uh, we talk about renewal of life on a social level, we live in such abysmal times, politically and socially, when there's so much hypocrisy that goes on in the world. It's uh, unbelievable already, it's uh, sickening. Uh, the lesson of a person like Rumi and the heritage that he left behind on the macro scale, on the social scale, I think is also very, very important. Now, my time is uh, coming to an end, and I want to conclude fairly soon. Uh, I want to talk about three other very important points of Rumi, which are important for the renewal of life in our day and age in the deepest sense. One is beauty. Uh, I just mentioned that Rumi was so sensitive to rhythm and music that he would go into a hall, a spiritual state, by just walking up the stairs. But just the rhythm, like a flamenco dancer tapping her feet on the ground, just the rhythm of the, of the shoe on the ground. Now, uh, Rumi is in many ways the supreme troubadour of beauty, uh, because he, more than anyone else, not only emphasized beauty in his poetry, but also the Sama, the Rumi, uh, the Molavi whirling dervishes dance that you have all seen pictures of or seen in films and things like that, which is one of the most beautiful forms of sacred art of this kind in the Islamic world, were actually due to his, to him. And everything he did was very beautiful, uh, all those who were around him. Uh, in a sense, of course, every saint has to be beautiful, has to have a beautiful soul in order to be saintly. But Rumi emphasized especially the significance of beauty, the, th- the therapeutic significance of beauty, that beauty heals the soul. Beauty heals. And uh, there are so many different aspects. Uh, uh, for example, he has some of the most beautiful poems about music. Uh, uh, music is one of the most inward arts that takes us right to the divine empyrean, especially classical Persian and Turkish music, which is deeply inspired by classical Persian music, uh, which is really not a social music, a military music, it's of interiorized, totally interiorized music, which you're going to hear in a few minutes, inshallah. And uh, he goes to the point 
of, in one of the most remarkable poems I've ever read. He addresses God and he says, changi mizani. We are like the harp and thou art the one who pluckest the harp. That is, we are ourselves the instruments in God's hands. What we do, what we say, what we think should be like music, not like cacophony. Unfortunately, most of us don't live up to that. But uh, Rumi was very, very much aware of this, of this sense of, of beauty, of ihsan. And as you know, in Arabic and Persian, you have this remarkable word, hus, which means both goodness and beauty. There's these two very different concepts which have been debated about so much in the history of ethics, philosophy, philosophy of ethics in the West, beauty versus uh, uh, ethics versus aesthetics. Uh, in Arabic, they're the same, really. Uh, the word is the same. Hus and Ihsan, my own name comes from that. It's a new name that was, did not exist in Arabic and the Prophet gave to his, his younger grandson. The name Hussein became, but it comes from the same root. Hassan, Hussein, Hussein, Hassan, they're all the same roots. And uh, that was the heart of Rumi's message. The fourth point that I want to mention is that uh, there is no possibility of the renewal of life intellectually without inward knowledge. It's possible to renew life ethically, artistically, morally, socially, but intellectually, uh, there has to be a renewal on the highest level of the intellect, of what we call esoteric knowledge, inward knowledge. And uh, in the modern study of Rumi, that is almost completely overlooked, almost completely overlooked. Whereas the Mastery of Rumi is a treasury of esoteric knowledge. It's called Bahram Arafat in Persian, the ocean of Gnosis. Always the great troubadour of love, it's called the ocean of Gnosis, Bahram Arafat. And it's remarkable how many pearls there are in that sea, if you can only learn how to dive for it, how to bring out the pearl in the deep meanings. It's just unbelievable, it's inexhaustible, absolutely inexhaustible, the amount of depth of knowledge that is contained in the Masnavi. And finally, I want to end with this, my time is also up. <coughs> Of course, Rumi has been called about everything else, the great poet of love, the troubadour of love. And he certainly is that. But we must understand that love, ish, ish which uh, is common between Arabic and Persian, uh, is not meant as sentimental emotion. It's very, very important to understand that. Uh, some of you are scholars here, are know, but some of you probably do not know. The word esh, I-S-H-Q or E-S-H-Q in Persian, uh, it comes from a plant, a vine, that wrapped itself around trees and pressed so much until it killed the tree. See how beautiful this is. Esh is that which kills us. Love, real love is what kills. It kills the lower self, for the only love that there really is, is the love of the, of the truth, of God. Everything that we love is ultimately the love of God without our knowing it. Even the most worldly person is really looking for that love, but looking in the wrong place. And of course, Rumi uh, spent all of his life speaking about this. His being was full of love, and he was able to explain the hierarchy of love that uh, there's no such thing as purely human love, purely divine love, purely worldly life, purely spiritual life. They're all part of the scale of the same thing, in like levels of light. Any love is ultimately a little ray of the love of God, ultimately, which is the highest form of love. And so uh, Rumi, at the beginning of the Masnavi, at the beginning of the Masnavi, uh, exalts love and in a remarkable way. And I want to uh, conclude my talk with just citing that for you. Many of you know that the, the, this poem is a very ecstatic uh, two verses beginning of the Mastavi. It says, Shad bash, 
ای دوای نخوت و ناموس ما ای تو افلاتون و جالینوس ما I think everything of, of Rumi is contained in these two verses. Let me translate it for you. I might break my pen to translate something like this. Hail to thee. I translate Shadbash. Hail to thee. Be happy. Hail to thee. O our love with goodly passion. O physician of all our ailments. O remedy of our pride and honor. O thou our Plato and Galen besides. May the love abide with all of you and especially this new year, renew your life in every way. Thank you. If you've journeyed with us this far, much love and gratitude for your presence. As a token of appreciation, we recommend exploring two more enlightening videos that align with your quest for wisdom. You can find them linked on your screen now.